Greetings, everyone. My name is Emily Jack Scott. I'm the program director at the Aspen Global Change Institute. We're a nonprofit dedicated to advancing global change, science, and solutions. We do this through an interdisciplinary science workshop series, independent research, and more practice oriented work that applies many of the lessons we learn through the science that we do into practice. We're very pleased to welcome you to, to tonight, this afternoon's tomorrow mornings, whatever time it might be for you. We're welcome to, uh, we're pleased to welcome you to today's Walter or Roberts Memorial Public Lecture. This series connects public audiences with emerging global change research. I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to NASA's Earth Science Division, which is supporting this public lecture this evening. And throughout the lecture, I encourage you all to direct your questions to the chat where we'll be able to, to field questions and answer a few of them during a, a question and answer session following the talk today. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yuri Rogel. He's the Director of Research at the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London. His research activities span many disciplinary boundaries, so he's a man after our own hearts, connecting Earth system sciences to the study of societal change and policy he has contributed to many climate change assessments that have informed international climate negotiations and has been a lead author on the annual emissions gap reports by the UN Environment Program, as well as multiple reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. He has also published on many topics relating to emission pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 and 2 degrees C. In that vein today, he is slated to speak with us about halting climate change, why zero emissions is only the beginning. And with that, Yuri, I would love to pass the floor to you and we look forward to your talk tonight. Let's see, there we go. Thank you once again for um, the opportunity and for the invitation to give this lecture um, here for you today. Um, it, it's a real honor and also a pleasure to uh, be talking about halting climate change and why zero emissions is only the beginning. I want to start with some pictures of uh, our recent, um, of the recent news. And I just want us to reflect on the fact that this is our world today. We have just experienced several years of intense wildfires in California, Australia, or even Russia. Um, we have floods destroying centuries old buildings in, in Germany, in Belgium. Uh, there, we have hurricane seasons with worrying large numbers of very strong hurricanes. There are heat waves that start to scratch the limits of, of human survivability. And we see back to back mass bleaching events of tropical coral reefs. So just keep in mind, this is our world today and we have already fundamentally changed it. And because of the nature of probabilities and extreme events, uh, we have probably not yet seen the worst of where we are actually today. And where are we today? Um, the planet has warmed by one degree since uh, mid of the 19th century, and we are responsible. And this is shown here on this figure from a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the special report on global warming of 1.5. What you can see here is um, in the gray, very noisy line, you can see the monthly global mean surface temperature or the monthly temperature of our planet. Uh, but then what is more important is the orange range on top, which shows the human cost part of that rise in global mean temperatures. And from that, it should be really clear that um, first of all, the world has warmed and also that we are responsible for this warming. Now, not only has the world changed, but we also expect it to still change quite a bit more. And this is a figure that is often used to communicate risks of climate change. It is referred to as the burning embers figure. And what is shown is basically five domains where impacts can happen, uh, five reasons for concern, and let me go quickly through them. Uh, unique and threatened systems, such as uh, coral reefs or, uh, or polar or Arctic uh, ecosystems, 
extreme weather events. I don't think they need explanation. Um, the question how vulnerable and poor populations are disproportionately impacted by climate change, global aggregate impacts, and then large scale singular events or tipping points in the climate system. And, and the colors you can see here on the bar, on the vertical axis, it, it runs from zero degrees of warming to two degrees uh, on the top. The colors have a specific meaning. White means that, that the level of climate risks is, is undetectable, or basically we cannot detect it beyond the background noise. Once, um, once we get to yellow, however, uh, risks are considered moderate. And that means that we can both detect it and attribute risks to human activities. If we then go further, if these risks and these impacts become more larger and of a global scale, uh, these bars get colored red. And finally, when very high risk, we, we determine or this, this figure determines uh, risks that, that follow in rapid succession so that we can really, we have, or this, the different systems really struggle with recovering from these impacts. And so what we can see here, when we look at the gray bar of where we were around uh, the 2010s, is that already today, what we experience today is classified as moderate risk. And further, if we look into the future, uh, 1.5 degrees of warming, um, at least two of those five reasons of concern would be in high risk. And if we, if we reach two degrees of warming, uh, pretty much all of them would be close to high risk or very high risk. So not only has our world changed, but we expect it to change quite a bit more. Now, of course, we also have a political process that tries to limit the climate change that we experience. In 1992, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. And that convention tries to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with our climate system. Now that is both ambitious and very vague. So over the years, this ambitious goal has been, has been made more specific by looking at the level of, of warming that we want to uh, avoid. And in 2015, the Paris Agreement then decided that we want to limit warming to well below two degrees relative to pre-industrial level while pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 above to 1.5. Um, they also noted that this would significantly reduce the risks uh, and impacts of climate change. Now, once we have set these targets, the question of course becomes, how do we stop global warming? And uh, the picture here on the right is just, again, once again, an image to show you and, and, to, ma and to make you appreciate the complexity of, of, of the system that we are actually looking at. Uh, the different land cover, covers that we see, there is land, there is ocean, there is a, there is a very turbulent atmosphere. So, so how can we stop global warming? So let's explore this with a simple thought experiment. Here, there you can see three panels that are currently empty. And we want to do, make a thought experiment and check what would happen if we stabilize the concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Now, we can, we can run this experiment with simple models. And if we increase our emissions, um, we see concentrations increase. And as a result, also global mean temperature increases. Now, if we would keep concentrations constant, however, we would not halt global warming. As a matter of fact, global warming would still continue slowly but surely for many centuries. So from that, we can derive that Simply stabilizing CO2 concentrations is not sufficient in first instance to halt global warming. So what can help us halt global warming? So let's do another, uh, let, let's do another uh, thought experiment. Now we emit emissions and then we suddenly halt all emissions. And that's what you can see now in the top panel. CO2 concentrations increase, but once we stop emitting CO2, CO2 concentrations don't stay constant but the CO2 in the atmosphere is gradually redistributed in uh, part of it goes in the ocean, part of it is taken up by the land 
and so CO2 concentrations decrease. As a result, uh, global warming, once we stop emitting CO2, uh, doesn't increase any further. And this is actually true for many levels of uh, total emissions that we emit, as you can see here um, for these different lines. In all cases, even if we, uh, even if we emit many, uh, a large amount of carbon dioxide emissions afterwards, once we stop CO2, uh, CO2 concentrations decline and temperature stays roughly constant. Now we can use this insight to develop a relationship between cumulative emissions and temperature increase. And there is indeed a roughly linear proportionality between the total amount of CO2 emissions uh, ever emitted and the total and the total amount of global warming that we will experience. Now, this relationship is of course extremely convenient. That means that when we won't want to halt warming, we need to keep emissions within a carbon budget. We can determine a temperature limit and we can read off a carbon budget. The gray range here shows that we are not, uh, we can't determine this relationship very precise, precisely. But that also means that if we want to have a higher probability of actually limiting warming to this temperature limit, like two degrees, we have to count with a smaller carbon budget. In the same sense, if we want to pursue a lower temperature limit, we also have to count with a lower carbon budget. And finally, I've only spoken about carbon dioxide until now, but we also emit other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, uh, in total, these other greenhouse gases result in additional warming. And also this contribution results in a smaller carbon budget. Now, these insights are not something that, um, that came just falling from the sky. Uh, actually, they built on research that, uh, that has been gradually established over uh, the past decades and particularly over the past Decade. So here you can see a timeline of, uh, of key moments in the international negotiations and uh, international climate negotiations, and also uh, the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in 2009, that was when there was a climate summit in Copenhagen. Uh, that was really a very important year for carbon budgets because many of the seminal papers that um, established the concept uh, were published in that year. They, they were studies explaining or highlighting the, the use of cumulative emissions targets to, to reducing the risk of dangerous climate change, uh, papers that quantified the proportionality between global warming and cumulative carbon emissions, uh, quantification finally also of how much carbon budget there would be if we want to limit warming to uh, two degrees in this case. All this information and all these insights were subsequently um, synthesized and assessed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And for those that do not know what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, the, the IPCC is an intergovernmental organization that uh, on regular intervals uh, produces assessments of the best available knowledge or produce scientific assessments of our knowledge of climate change. And this figure is kind of a synthesis figure of our knowledge uh, at the time of the fifth assessment report in 2013. So what you can see here is that um, in gray on this figure, you can see again this relationship between cumulative emissions on the horizontal axis and temperatures on the vertical axis. The gray feature here shows what the relationship would be if we only emit CO2. The red and, 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 and other colored features show what the relationship is if we also take into account other greenhouse gases or other climate forces, such like uh, air pollutants. The small inset shows here that also that relationship holds for the observational period. And then finally here at the bottom, what is really useful is this is kind of the first high level um, quantification of how much carbon budget there is left for limiting warming to 1.5, 2, 2 and a half, or 3. So this information was, was welcomed uh, very strongly in the international negotiations. And here you can see a picture 
from the International Climate Summit in, uh, in Lima. This was in uh, 2014, where you can see um, the simple concept of a carbon budget being highlighted during the plenary to all the delegates. This concept was actually very much welcomed. It was a simple message, as you can see here from these slides, that was easily that could be easily communicated to policymakers, and um, and so it really rapidly gained a lot of traction. However, although we thought that we really solved this complex problem of figuring out how we can limit climate change easily, uh, then a very simple question followed, um, and that question was how much CO2 can we actually emit? Um, and that answer was actually uh, slightly harder than uh, simply establishing the concept that, there, that a carbon budget exists. Um, here, without going through all these numbers in the interest of time, there were already several estimates available in the same IPCC report. Um, then subsequently, there were several studies that came out with also, again, different um, different estimates. There were studies that showed that um, correcting for near for for uh, historical uh, uncertainties really could uh, change the estimates of the remaining carbon budget. There were studies that showed how there were different definitions of the carbon budget that um, that changed how we look and understand how much emissions would still be available. There were studies that showed that um, actually, if we uh, stop emitting CO2 and we wait for a couple, some centuries, uh, depending on how much we emitted, warming might uh, actually uh, rise again. Or there were studies that then looked at uh, the contributions of non-CO2 and found it all, all very, very, very confusing. So this is actually where after the, the first um, uh, euphoric feelings of the IPCC fifth assessment report in 2013, 2014, we landed in the year 2016 or 2017. The question of what determines the remaining carbon budget was then actually put to the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change once again, in the, in the context of the preparation of its special report on global warming of 1.5. And as part of that special report, uh, we were able to actually, um, to actually get some clarity uh, about the different puzzle pieces that determine how much carbon dioxide we can still emit for limiting warming below a certain temperature level. In, in total, five factors, five key factors determine how much carbon budget there is left. First of all, the historical warming to date, uh, it speaks for itself. The, the more we warm, the closer we are to a certain limit, and thus uh, the less carbon budget there is left. Second, the proportionality between global warming and our amount of, or, and the cumulative emissions that we emit, which we call uh, the transient climate response to cumulative emissions, and also any additional warming that we would still see if we would uh, bring emissions to zero. So maybe it's not perfectly zero, maybe there's still a slight amount of warming, that would be the third term. The fourth component would be the uh, projected future non-CO2 warming, and that warming or that component um, depends not only on how many emissions or, or what the emissions will be, but also what the climate response to those emissions would be. And that is not such a easy, uh, an easy uh, factor to determine. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see some of the some illustrations of key sources of, for example, methane or uh, other non-CO2 emissions like nitrous oxide. And uh, for many of those um, activities, we don't necessarily know yet how we can eliminate the emissions of those activities. And uh, we also don't necessarily know how deeply they can be uh, reduced. The final component is are then earth system feedbacks uh, or accounting for earth system feedbacks that would otherwise not be captured. And these Five components can then be combined, again, in this same space where we have cumulative emissions on the horizontal axis and, vert and uh, global warming on the vertical axis. And so combining these five components, we can then here on the horizontal axis start and read off 
uh, or calculate the remaining carbon budget. So enough about the concept. Let's see how much carbon budget we actually have left. And the IPCC special report came out with this very complicated table to go in it uh, in, in detail. So let me just pick out a couple of key numbers. These are the updated uh, remaining carbon budgets, updated with, by uh, subtracting the emissions over the past couple of years, and also already accounting for uh, earth system feedbacks that would otherwise not be covered. And this both for 1.5 and 2 degrees, and for different probabilities of actually limiting warming to those levels. Um, Maybe these values don't, don't tell you so much immediately. These, this is, uh, this are, these units are billion tons of CO2. But it helps maybe to know that currently we are emitting around 40 billion tons of CO2 per year in the atmosphere. So that really means that um, to stay within the, this limit, we need to uh, reduce emissions linearly to zero in, in roughly 20 years uh, to limit warming to two degrees with a two out of three chance we would need to reduce emissions uh, from today's levels in a straight line to zero in roughly 50 years. Um, furthermore, the IPCC also highlighted that reaching and sustaining net zero global anthropogenic CO2 emissions and declining non-CO2 radiative forcing would indeed halt anthropogenic global warming. So what does this mean, what does this mean for pathways? Um, here on the horizontal axis, you can see time. On the vertical axis, global CO2 emissions. And the big bubble is the remaining carbon budget. Now, staying within this budget is simple. Of course, we need to bring global CO2 emissions down to net zero. The total amount or the cumulative amount of emissions that we have emitted until then will define the peak warming level to, to first order. And the timing of peak warming will also, again, to first order coincide with the time that we reach uh, net zero. After we have reached net zero, either we can keep emissions at net zero, or we can go, go uh, deeper and reach net negative emissions. And that would then result in a slowly reversal and a slow decline in global temperatures. How, how does this look quantitatively? Um, in pathways that limit warming to well below and well below two degrees and close to 1.5, global carbon dioxide emissions um, show a robust declining trend in the next decade uh, in the range of around 40 to 60 percent below 2010 levels by 2030. And they reach net zero levels around 2050. As you can see, there is quite some variation depending on the exact path that you follow. Um, Together with those deep reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, also deep reductions in non-CO2 emissions uh, need to be achieved. However, uh, together, net zero greenhouse gas emissions are not reached by mid-century, but only about two decades later. The knowledge and, and, and the understanding that we reach, need to reach net zero was actually already uh, understood and acknowledged uh, at the time of the Paris Agreement. Here you can again see the, uh, the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement that we already saw earlier. But two pages further down in the Paris Agreement, uh, in Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, it actually also says that uh, countries should reach global peaking of greenhouse gases as soon as possible. They should reduce them as uh, rapidly thereafter. And they should achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases. So the Paris Agreement actually calls not only to reach net zero CO2, but actually net zero greenhouse gas emissions. So what does that actually mean? So in, in the previous figures, I always showed net emissions, but actually, the, the, the lines that were shown there are consist of two of at least two uh, contributions. First, we have deep reductions in CO2 emissions. However, there are limits to how deeply we can reduce our CO2 emissions because at this stage we have several um, 
several sectors for which we have no, uh, for which we do not know yet entirely how to uh, eliminate all emissions. So that means that each of those uh, that while we need deep reductions in, in CO2 emissions, they need to be um, added or they need to be uh, accompanied by also CO2 removal. Um, because the concept of CO2 removal might sound a bit strange, I quickly want to spend one slide on giving a couple of examples of what CO2 removal actually co consists of. And um, this slide shows uh, different methods of CO2 removal. Uh, some of them might be familiar to you and some of them might be more, uh, more novel or more technical. There, there are carbon dioxide removal methods that use uh, our biological system. And for example, like reforestation or uh, methods that increase the amount of carbon that is captured and stored in our soils. Um, there are methods that use biomass and uh, convert that to electricity or ethanol in facilities and then capture the CO2 and sequester it under, underground, which is called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. There are methods that, uh, that use crushed rocks to, um, to basically draw down CO2 from the atmosphere or that use chemical filters uh, to directly draw down CO2 out of the atmosphere or to capture CO2 out of the atmosphere and again, store it um, in deep geological formation. Important, however, is that many of those methods uh, are not yet um, available at a global or a globally significant level. And that also, as you can already tell, um, many of those methods also require land. And generally we use land also for other uh, purposes, both agricultural, but, but, but equally for biodiversity protection. So there is a clear trade-off between the use of these carbon dioxide removal methods and um, some of the sustainable development goals that we are trying to pursue. However, we now understand a bit better what these anthropogenic removals are and where uh, emissions and removal balance out, that's where we achieve net zero CO2 emissions. But remember what the art, Article 4 of the Paris Agreement said, uh, it wanted to balance all greenhouse gas emissions. So that means that uh, in pathways that are Paris compatible, in addition, we also see very deep reductions in other greenhouse gases. And for these greenhouse gases, we can express them in CO2 equivalents by using what we call greenhouse gas metrics. And if we use the standard metric that is used in the United Nations, the global warming potentials over a hundred year, we can also define a time when we reach net zero greenhouse gases. You can just see that um, reaching net zero CO2 already needs a certain amount of CO2 removal. Um, reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions actually requires net negative CO2 emissions. And um, so the question is, what does this mean for the climate? Here on the left hand side, you can see the same figure as I, as I was showing in the, in the last slide. On the right hand side, you can see the temperature outcome. Um, you can see we are here again at around one degrees. And you can see how it changes over the century. And what you can see is that at the time that we reach net zero CO2, uh, global temperatures would roughly uh, stabilize. Now, if you go further and we reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we would actually reach more than simply stabilizing, um, see, uh, stabilizing global warming. We would actually peak and slowly start to decline global warming. If we then get even further to net negative greenhouse gas emissions, we would simply uh, accelerate this continued decline. So with this, uh, we know what we want. Uh, limiting warming well below two degrees, uh, pursuing to limit it to 1.5, and we know what we need to do. Um, so at the end of my talk and of this lecture, um, I would like to share with you uh, and, and look together at how we are doing. Um, every year with the UNEP, uh, the UN Environment Programme's Emissions Gap Report, uh, we, we make an update of where emissions are heading and where they should be going in order to limit warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees. 
And, and there are other, also other organizations that do, do that. And this visual is, for example, from Climate Action Tracker. Um, let's have a look at what this visual shows. Uh, it shows global greenhouse gas emissions. Here at the bottom, you can see 1.5 and 2 degrees C consistent pathways in the green and the yellow ranges. Um, so this is where we would like to be if we want to limit warming to within the limits of the Paris Agreement. Um, at the opposite end, at the total top, we then can see the blue range, which is where our current policies are leading us. That is the policies that are, that are on the books or that are currently being implemented. Um, you can see that they still lead us to roughly three degrees of warming, which uh, just for, for reference is of the charts of, uh, of the risk of the climate risk figure that I showed uh, before uh, at the very beginning of this talk. Um, if we would actually implement the pledges and the target that countries have put forward, uh, this would be further reduced. And lately, governments have come forward with so-called net zero targets, uh, which are, which, uh, in which they promise to bring down their emissions to net zero by mid-century or shortly thereafter. And this is definitely a very, um, a very positive development, but at this stage, we need to categorize them as very optimistic because, because the near-term policies, uh, first of all, are insufficient to meet near-term pledges, and the near-term pledges are insufficient to put countries' greenhouse gas emissions on track to meet those long-term net zero targets. Concluding then, going back to the beginning, uh, this is our world today uh, that we experience today. These were the, uh, the risks and the climate that, that we are still projected simply for the, for the range of warming that, um, that is still consistent with the Paris Agreement. And with that, um, I think we really need to think about climate change and we really need to start thinking about going beyond zero emissions. Uh, net zero is the bare minimum required to halt warming from CO2 and more is needed to halt uh, warming from all greenhouse gases. Achieving the Paris Agreement uh, already implies going beyond net zero CO2 emissions. And 1.5 degree or higher warming is likely to be highly undesirable. Um, and this would, will likely lead to a drive to reverse global warming faster in the long term. Thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to your questions. And after that, uh, let's get on with it. and try and halt climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. We do have a few questions. Um, one is how much do the non-CO2 gases reduce the allowable greenhouse gas budget for reaching a certain temperature target compared to carbon dioxide only? Yeah, so um, it, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, compared to what? Uh, so already in these, for, for the budgets that I presented, we assume very stringent or equally stringent uh, reductions in non-CO2 greenhouse gases. That means roughly, uh, because we don't know yet how to eliminate them fully, that means that methane is roughly halved uh, over the next uh, decades as well, uh, until mid-century. Uh, also N2O is, is definitely not increasing any further. Uh, so that is already assumed within uh, the estimations of, the, uh, of these carbon budgets. Um, anything that would, we would be doing less uh, would, would mean that the carbon budget is, uh, will become smaller. Uh, what we identified, however, is that because the, we don't exactly know how successful we will be or, or what the exact mitigation potential of these non-CO2 greenhouse gases is, is that um, depending on how successful or unsuccessful we are, at, uh, at reducing them. The remaining carbon budget can be larger or smaller by around 250 gigatons, um, which of course, if your remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees um, is around 400 gigatons, uh, makes a very big difference. Wonderful. And what considerations are being made for stepwise decreases in emissions opposed to a linear decrease? For example, if a new technology suddenly became widely implemented as opposed to gradually over time? Yeah, I think um, it will always be a line. Um, so, and uh, 
because even technologies, well, if, if, if there's so, suddenly a new technology, it will take until that technology can actually reach um, a stage that it can be rolled out. And even the rollout will need time uh, for the simple reason that you need to have the engineers that know the technology can roll it out and, and all that kind of thing. So there's quite a bit of inertia uh, that is quite well understood in how fast technologies can uh, scale up. To be sure, um, when I spoke about a linear decline, that was just to give you a very simple uh, back of the envelope indication of what the implications are of those carbon budgets. Um, in those pathways that I, um, that I highlight, uh, would they actually take into account in, in more sophisticated way, kind of uh, the, uh, the, the dynamics of technology, uh, diffusion and, and dispersion. Uh, in a way, I think, given the very small carbon budgets that we have, any technology that we don't know uh, we have today or don't know about today is likely to come slightly too late uh, for, um, for the time that we have left to go to 1.5, uh, to go to net zero in order to limit warming to 1.5 or even well below two degrees. Uh, next question is, what about developed versus developing countries? Should net zero be a commitment for all, or should developed countries commit to negative emissions to let developing countries emit more to achieve a comparable level of development? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. It's, it's a really good question. Uh, unfortunately, given the time, I was only able to give a, a global picture. Um, what matters for the planet is global emissions need to reach net zero or net negative emissions if we want to slowly start reversing global warming. Um, this will be different uh, depending on the context where, uh, where you find yourself. Um, the discrepancy between uh, developed and developing countries is, is, more, an ethical, uh, is, is more an ethical difference. Um, but there is, there is another uh, example or where, where this um, where the achievement of net zero will will differ a lot and that is not every country has the potential to has, has a large net negative uh, or carbon dioxide removal potential um, there are countries that have lots of forest there are countries that have good geological conditions um, they are so that means that there are countries that are in a, a favored position to achieve carbon dioxide removal achieve net zero and net negative emissions. And if we want to achieve global um, net zero emissions, then it will be important that those regions and those countries that can go deeper also go deeper than net zero emissions. And the challenge of course is, is how we provide the incentives. What are the incentive structures for countries um, to, to do so? And um, so, on the one hand, of already from the technical perspective, but then of course also from the ethical perspective, where developing countries uh, are trying not only to deal with the climate uh, challenge, but also uh, try to tackle uh, development problems, poverty, and um, and and hunger. And I'll last. I'll ask one more last question um, in plenary here, and then uh, we do have the meeting locked so that we will have the chance to continue questions and answer as well as some informal networking and some breakout groups after this. Um, hopefully without further disruption. Uh, Gabby asked the question, the exact carbon budget depends on how we define global mean temperature and on what we think pre-industrial temperatures were, what, we, what greenhouse gas exactly include, et cetera. How do we avoid the discussion around those issues to become a distraction that makes it harder to meet the goal and one where we quote unquote failed if we miss by a small amount? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's, it, it refers to a very kind of technical discussion, which is very happily taken as a distraction indeed for, um, for what needs to happen. I think, um, unfortunately, uh, but conveniently, I think currently we are so close to the limits that we are trying to achieve um, that this discussion has uh, vir become virtually uh, irrelevant. Um, if we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and we want to define it that warming with GMST, 
or with a different historical or pre-industrial reference period. Uh, in all cases, this will involve reducing emissions in the next decade uh, quite significantly. So uh, the, the top level message doesn't change. Of course, um, and, and I think also there in, 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 in the challenge to deal with, with, with climate change, I think one shouldn't uh, lose sight of the bigger picture. Uh, the bigger picture is that currently emissions, uh, well, the, are still increasing. The, the COVID pandemic has, has, has caused a small dip, but uh, we have not yet high confidence that this has really changed uh, the, the structural and, and, the, and, and, the, and the direction of travel for our global emissions. Um, as long as they're going up, we don't have to dream about reaching net zero. Um, we, we should be first thinking about how we are starting to decline our global emissions. And once we are on a declining path, and ideally a steeply declining path, uh, th there are, again, other discussions to be had. So I think uh, the big picture today is really how do we bring emissions down in the next decade uh, from increasing over the past five. 